Okay. Um, a really beautiful Friday. I really appreciate people's commitment to being in the work and the um, So I thought I would do is maybe just say a few kind of things about what this, where this paper emerged from, where it came from, and then uh, where it's going. And then um, make a few points uh, on the topic. Um, this essay is called Soul City Sioux and the Korea Blues. Black Descent During the Forgotten War. And uh, it's uh, part of an anthology, forthcoming anthology done by Fred Ho uh, called Afro-Asia Revolutionary Connections. So uh, I say that um, to say that it deliberately accentuates some of the more kind of marginal or radical or uh, maybe uh, non-mainstream aspects of the particular historical subject that I'm looking at. So it's not meant necessarily to be representative or evocative of them maybe the whole sleep of African-American history in regards to the Korean War, but rather to focus more uh, pointedly on those radical elements which emerged uh, in that time. Uh, and I'm hoping that it will be a chapter in uh, my second book, which uh, hopefully will be called something along the lines of the Cross Currents of the Black Pacific, uh, Rethinking African and Asian Connections. And um, that'll have a few chapters. One deals with Japanese Americans and African Angeles, that this is out early. Uh, another chapter deals with black power movement in Australia, um, the Australian black power, and a few others that are as yet kind of reform. So um, I'm happy for any comments or suggestions or critiques that people have, because uh, this is kind of a live audience, and uh, there's time to make modifications, clarifications, alterations. Okay. And excuse me in advance for reading. Um, which isn't the most, uh, like, uh, the best way to hear a paper, but since I want people to help me shape it, um, that's what I'm going to do. On January 11, 1951, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Special Counsel Thurgood Marshall flew to Japan and Korea in order to investigate the condition of 39 black soldiers convicted by courts martial as a result of their conduct during the first three months of the Korean conflict. The dispatch of the organization's top troubleshooter highlighted both the serious nature of the charges. One convicted lieutenant had been sentenced to death for refusing a direct order to, to lead an attack, and the firestorm of adverse publicity concerning the performance of black soldiers engaged in furious battles against Korea and later Chinese forces. Marshall's investigation, published by the NAACP, brought into sharp relief not only the ongoing debates about the place of race within the armed forces, but the larger role of African Americans within an American polity busily expanding its footprint throughout the world. The essay that follows traces one set of black responses to the forgotten war on the Korean Peninsula. Dissent, unease, and opposition form the primary analytic frame for the quite simple reason that they have not been uh, taken up elsewhere. Within African American history, for the most part, the Korean conflict is seen as less important than either the preceding Second World War or the subsequent war in Vietnam. Military integration, in fact, is usually the, the primary thing that people talk about in reference to Korea. To the extent that the conflict is recalled at all then, it's positioned as an interlude between uh, the kind of uh, war for democracy and the birth of the modern civil rights movement in the Second World War and then the explosion of dissent uh, that accompanied Vietnam. <clears throat> this is unfortunate, I think, as a fuller rendering of black responses, including a focus on dissent provided herein, serves to illustrate dimensions of the conflict that in the final analysis, I think, cost enough lives um, both uh, American, Korean, and Chinese, to deserve serious analysis within its own time and place. Doing so, I think, may actually help to explain both why the war has been forgotten and why remembering it can provide a new perspective on both the past and the present, but that, that takes us a deal uh, for now. Six months after the publication of Marshall's report, a group of 54 black soldiers wrote Pittsburgh Courier columnist P.L. Prattis in the hopes of publicizing their unhappiness with the war. Citing discrimination against black soldiers at home and abroad, the authors challenged the basis of the conflict, claiming that the war was less a defense against communist aggression than yet another attempt to prop up a colonial order. Invoking a vernacular epithet generally reserved for overbearing white people, they termed the conflict Mr. Charlie's War, before concluding by mocking Supreme Commander Douglas MacArthur. Paraphrasing his famous edict, they noted, while old soldiers never die, many of young ones do. Mm -hmm. The soldiers who wrote Prattis were, as they used to say, on about something. 
Today, the notion of a more or less defensive struggle against communist aggression forms the most common American understanding of the war. Lost now are those contemporary depictions of the conflict as an American invasion more comparable to U.S. efforts in the Philippines, the Caribbean, or Central America than to the grand ideological struggle of the Second World War. For the most part, the erasure of the Korean conflict as an imperialist intervention is understandable, given both the general lack of interest in the first war lost by the United States and the conviction that American expeditionary forces sought only to provide a defensive shield. At the time, however, a broad swath of African Americans, including not only political radicals, but thousands of soldiers, sailors, civilians, saw the war less as a desperate struggle against Moscow surrogates than as another untimely and ultimately self-serving effort to influence the political processes of the non-white people trying to chart an independent post-colonial course. African Americans had long seen uh, excursions into the Pacific through an explicitly anti-colonial lens. As a number of recent studies have shown, the war between Japan and the United States was raged across a, a completely racialized landscape. It's interesting, the war with Japan, um, race in that war influences everything from the strategic planning, right, the decision to ultimately use not one but two nuclear bombs, uh, to the conduct of the occupation, even to the process of planning um, uh, the entirety of the thing, really, the representations of the press and so forth. The aftermath of the war, moreover, scattered black soldiers and sailors across the ocean, transforming the black Pacific from an imagined community of transnational anti-racism into an actually existing arc of complex social interactions. Here I'm thinking about the Solomon Islands in particular, which is a very interesting case. There's a book by Jeffrey White called The, the Great, The Big Death, Big Death. And it's about the Solomon Islands in the aftermath of World War II, and there's really fascinating testimonies by these Solomon Islanders talk about these black GIs as the first um, black people they had ever seen with uniforms, weapons, shoes in some case, and how kind of Solomon Islands and South Pacific nationalism was um, influenced by the presence of these black soldiers. In the immediate post-war period then, events in Korea proved difficult to separate from larger discussions of decolonization. Communists, progressives, and left nationalists saw worldwide battle between reputable nationalists like Mao Zedong, Kim Il Sung, and Uncle Tom's, like Chinese, uh, these are in quotes, right? Uh, by Chinese nationalist leader Chiang Kai shek and South Korean President Seaman Rhee, whom African American scholar J.A. Rogers called senile and incompetent. Thus, by the time the war began in the 1950s, many readers of the black press had, had, some, had at least some familiarity with the argument that the United States was actively impeding efforts of unification on the Korean Peninsula. The black paper with the most extensive coverage of the war, the Baltimore Afro-American, pointedly compared the struggle in Korea to the Boxer Rebellion, noting that the 1950s did not mark the first time that Asians had fought against combined armies drawn from Europe and Japan. The composition of UN expeditionary forces did little to reassure critics of U.S. foreign policy. Ostensibly, first world nations provided the bulk of UN coalition forces with Australia, Belgium, Canada, Greece, New Zealand, and tiny Luxembourg sending combat detachments. Some of the largest contingents came from the English, the Dutch, and the French, each of whom was busily fighting the Southeast Asian guerrilla uh, insurgency. With full recovery from the Second World War years away, none of these three could afford an expensive, open-ended conflict, and each came to rely on the United States subsidies in order to maintain their political and military positions in the region. Such was the conclusion of one prescient observer who noted, the smoke of battle in Korea has not yet cleared, and already French capitalists are crying for our boys to be used to protect their interests. Very interesting, because it's actually during the Korean War that um, the Military Assistance Command for uh, Indochina is set up. So already, the American kind of effort in Vietnam begins during Korea. It's interesting, because I have a graduate student at um, UCSD, who's an older gentleman, uh, who was involved in the Nixon administration, in fact, he accidentally um, sort of created the Watergate scandal, Alex Butterfield. And we were talking about this, and he was telling me he had been in Laos in uh, the late 50s. Mm -hmm. And he remembered when the first American plane was shot down in China, it was shot down over Laos. So it's very interesting to see sort of this as a kind of 25-year-long period of U.S. war in Asia, as opposed to partitioning, I think, you know, the Philippine insurgency, Korea, and Vietnam as distinct. In any event, 
Among those skeptical of American motivations in Korea, one ally provoked particular ire. As Thomas Borstelman notes, the Korean conflict confirmed the Republic of South Africa as the United States' primary ally on the African continent. The Korean War erupted just as the legal framework of apartheid was being established with the Group Areas Act, the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act, and the Suppression of Communism Act echoing legislation passed in the United States. South Africa contributed an Air Force squadron to the UN effort, and at least one South African official offered to raise a levy of 100,000 colored soldiers. Young soldiers are airmen, however, and alliance with South Africa promised a steady supply of uranium, a key resource for an American military openly considering the use of nuclear weapons against Chinese and Korean targets. Anti-imperialist black activists criticized this expanding strategic alliance between the segregated United States, apartheid South Africa, and Europe's colonial powers, claiming South Africa in her treatment of colored people represents a greater challenge to world peace than Korea. The Council on African Affairs added that neither might of wealth nor military power can settle these struggles in Asia or Africa. The Council's call, authored by W.E.B. Du Bois, was endorsed by more than 100 black activists, journalists, artists, labor leaders, professionals, and clergy, including Council on African Affairs leaders Robeson and Paul and Du Bois, uh, Baltimore Afro-American editor Wes Matthews, producer Carlton Moss, naval officer Hugh Malzak, artist Aaron Douglas and Charles White, and several regional NAACP secretaries. Los Angeles publisher Charlotte Bass asked how Americans could debate losing Korea and China as if they were ours in the first place. While another woman wrote caustically that she was personally tired of having Ralph Bunch dangle from flagpoles before adding, this is a living example of democracy that we spread in Korea, heaven help the Korean people. Even more moderate observers seemed inclined to regard events in Korea as part of a broad transformation underway throughout the world. A news release from the Associated Negro Press wire service termed the conflict a clash of white against color of imperialism versus nationalism claiming America is the last bulwark of the colonial powers, the ANP went on to conclude, if she's beaten in Korea, the whole structure of colonialism will be shaken and toppled. Pittsburgh Courier columnists wrote in Korea, in Indochina, in Tunisia, in South Africa, in India, the West Indies, South America, and the United States, the magic that made chattel slaves of some, peons of many, and sharecroppers of others is furiously losing its charm. Despite his own anti-communism, NAACP head Walter White warned that, white, uh, that the animosity of China and North Korea risked an implacable hatred growing toward white people worldwide. Having earlier spoken of the growing connection between black Americans and the colonial world, White predicted a worldwide racial conflict was inevitable unless white nations completed an about face on the issue of race. Others, however, disputed these claims of a racialized war. The Los Angeles Sentinel called claims of a race war ill-founded, instead informing readers that the war constituted a clash between political beliefs that had adherents of every color. A letter to the editor of the Afro-American agreed, noting that the presence of tan Yanks, as well as troops from the Philippines and Siam, proved the war against aggression, rather than one of whites against a common race. And the Chicago Defender, writing only days before Chinese intervention, argued that the impending UN victory offered a lesson to the Russians, whom the paper blamed for leading the initial attack. Despite these claims, the war's racial overturns proved hard to ignore. Battlefield reports often made explicit reference to racial issues. Thus, the Afro-American reported on a unit of North Korean soldiers in blackface attempting to infiltrate American positions. On another occasion, the paper led with a discussion of North Korean radio broadcasts aimed at black soldiers placing the article over a headline describing the bombing of the 24th Infantry Regiment as a black unit by American uh, aircraft. This latter issue particularly vexed black soldiers who complained repeatedly about launching costly attacks that had to be abandoned following poorly aimed air and artillery barrages. More than one soldier, in fact, prefaced his comments in support of military integration by noting he thought he was less likely to be bombed by American planes if he was in a mixed unit. <laughs> Newspaper accounts provided some sense of a growing uh, disenchantment with the war on the part of black enlisted men. In addition to the aforementioned Courier Group, the Daily People's World reprinted a song penned by an injured private that included the stanza proclaiming, Till our discharge we must take it, many good things we must miss, 
Don't let the draft board get you in for God's sake, don't enlist. <laughs> Critical opinions by other black soldiers prompted Curtis Morrow, who had volunteered for the army, to declare the war bullshit. <laughs> Others wrote of their unease with the racist language used by many American soldiers, prompting the New York Age to tell readers that gook is just another way of saying nigger. As in the war with Japan, racist depictions of a savage and inhuman enemy became commonplace. Chinese soldiers attacking in mass without artillery or air support were generally referred to as ants or other kinds of insects. The second highest ranking American military official, uh, military official in Korea, Major General Edward Ned Ullman, sought to rally a group of Marines destined for annihilation at the Chosun Reservoir with instructions not to let a bunch of laundrymen stop you. The ostensible aims of the war, however, as well as the presence of allied Asian armies, limited official tolerance for openly derogatory references to the enemy. MacArthur's racially segregated headquarters thus issued an advisory instructing soldiers to avoid using the word boot, while an article published in the military paper Tips informed readers that insulting and alienating language provides ammunition for the propaganda war waged against democratic nations. Still, endemic racism constituted the primary challenge for observers seeking to recast the war narrative away from discussions of race. The white chaplain of the segregated 24th Regiment frankly admitted his bias, conceding, I'm prejudiced against Negroes, even though I'm a minister. One white soldier asked about the feasibility of integrating domestic bases, which responded that if they send blacks in one at a time, they may as well send the coffin with them. While another held that you integrate units and pretty soon it will lead to intermarriage. I'm not sure if this was like an anticipation of gays in the military or gay marriage or quite how to make sense of that. <laughs> another infantryman, betraying a familiarity, if not an affinity with black culture, claimed, I'd flatten one on his back if he can play that game they call the dozens, hitting you on your back and saying, hello, motherfucker. Such reactions indicated potentially deadly tension, and not simply a transitory prejudice. As when wounded soldiers awaiting repatriation told a white first lieutenant Adolph Watt in San Francisco that serving with nigger bastards would get him killed. During the first months of the war, nearly all black soldiers served under white officers, many of whom seemed to regard commanding a black unit as a form of career suicide. Black units regularly went into battle with inferior and outdated equipment. Institutional racism, moreover, extended well beyond the presence of ill-equipped poorly trained battalions, poorly led battalions. Black soldiers repeatedly claimed that their request for air and artillery support went ignored, while donated blood was labeled by race until protests by United Nations staff forced to change. Journalists sent to Korea to cover the process of military desegregation angrily questioned the military's conduct of the war. Courier art, uh, editorials noted that segregation precluded the posting of white reinforcements to black units engaged in combat, the fact that it left understrength battalions exposed to destruction through attrition. The combination of poor leadership, inferior equipment, and impossible assignments was taken up in an editorial that answered the question, what gives in Korea, by telling readers that the deliberate creation of conditions under which black soldiers could only fail provided uh, an out for fearful whites seeking a way to resist the elimination of military Jim Crow. Insult followed injury. Although military secretaries had been formally desegregated in 1948, Congressional Medal of Honor winner Sergeant Cornelius Charlton was denied burial in Arlington National Cemetery, suggesting that while there may not have been any racists in foxholes, there were still a few directing the burial procedures of the armed forces. Nowhere was the war's sharply racial relief brought into greater focus than in the prisoner of war camps dotting North Korea's mountainous northern frontier. Seesaw battles during the first year of the war left uh, whole units prisoners of advancing North Korean and Chinese forces. When the latter took administrative control of UN prisoners of war, uh, sustained political work began to be conducted among the more than 7,000 captured American troops. American prisoners were separated according to their political meanings, with progressives and reactionaries standing on opposite sides of the political spectrum. The extent and apparent effect of Chinese efforts, post-war estimates put the number of troops said to have collaborated with their captors as high as one-third, led to a decade of debate concerning the mental and physical stamina of American servicemen. Much of this debate turned on the purported brainwashing of American personnel. 
Amidst more coercive methods, indoctrination included both political education and struggle sessions focused on generating critique of the war and American society in general. Uh, as with every other U.S. war in Asia, black soldiers were seen as logically open to precisely such entreaties. Discussions of racial conditions in the United States formed one core of Chinese propaganda efforts, and black soldiers were among those most pressed to write letters, sign peace petitions, or participate in radio broadcasts announcing the war. Roger Fletcher, a captured member of the segregated 24th, noted that racial themes were common during education sessions. Told to go back to your country and help start the revolution, Fletcher informed American officials after his repatriation that the Chinese did not like white people very much. Post-war surveys of prisoner of war behavior, otherwise bitterly opposed, are unified in proclaiming the Negro GI as no more susceptible to red propaganda than his white children. As one recent study notes, however, post-war research concerning POW behavior deliberately avoids using race as an analytic category, ignoring, for example, the segregation of returning prisoners by American officials after the armistice. So in other words, when people were um, let out of these prison camps and brought back to the United States, they were re-interrogated uh, by American officials on their way back to the States, and the votes were segregated by race. One notable exception, Edward Hunter's book, Brainwashing, contains an entire chapter devoted to what he terms the Korean miracle of black resistance to communist entreaty. Leaving aside the question of why black loyalty to the United States should be seen as miraculous, Hunter's methodological and ideological proclivities make his book a curious historical source. The former propagandist for the OSS, this is the forerunner, of course, of the CIA, Hunter actually seems to have coined the term brainwashing, he saw black resistance as emerging from a cultural matrix based upon Christianity, faith in America, and the example of selfless service provided by Joe Lewis. And I mean, literally, it's true. He has this chapter in his book. He says, well, you know, black people were, didn't become communists because they didn't believe in God and because of Joe Lewis, <laughs> thanks to the Brown Bomber, I guess. Both the term itself and Hunter's insistence that black Americans prove no more susceptible than whites are worthy of note. In the context of Cold War struggle, changing race relations and the purported superiority of life became questions very much linked to national security. As a result, both the conscious desire to minimize incidents of race difference during wartime and the insistence that anyone who preferred life under socialism was clinically insane can be seen as the ideological imperative of a society locked in a struggle as all-encompassing as it was fierce. Given these gaps, it is entirely possible that black soldiers tacitly agreed with Chinese commentary linking capitalism to racism and imperialism, or not. Perhaps black soldiers, eager to press their claims toward full citizenship, saw little of value in the mandatory political education prisoners attended. On the other hand, Chinese efforts may simply have come one war too early. Unlike Vietnam, where hundreds, if not thousands, of black GIs would create autonomous zones like Saigon's Seoul Alley, refuse to fight or publicly agree with Muhammad Ali's refusal to quarrel with them Viet Cong, the pattern of separating black soldiers into their own areas during the Korean conflict generated considerable resentment among soldiers reminded of painful domestic conditions. Chinese efforts made an impression on white prisoners as well. More than a fifth of returning white prisoners listed members of minority groups as the primary targets of Chinese efforts. Prison life exacerbated pre-existing tensions, and at least some white prisoners angrily rejected what they saw as preferences of treatment given to minority group Americans. Small groupings of reactionary prisoners organized into groups like the Free Hearts of America, the non benedict Arnold Club, the War Camp, and the Un-American Activities Committee. As one of the studies most sympathetic to American prisoners notes, however, the most prevalent resistance organization among servicemen was called the Ku Klux Klan. Cells of between two and four Klansmen sought to intimidate prisoners away from collaboration with their captors through threats and occasional acts of violence. Against the backdrop of resistance coordinated by Klansmen, collaboration was generally in the eye of the beholder. The daughter of one serviceman who refused repatriation pointedly asked, if someone points out something you already know, like America is racist, is that brainwashing? In addition to political education classes, soldiers were encouraged to make written and oral declarations questioning the aims and value of the war. The most notable of these were the daily radio broadcasts recorded in Korea broadcast over shortwave radio from Beijing. 
both white and black servicemen participated in this broadcast, which featured Chinese announcers. Details of the broadcast were carried in the mainstream media, the communist press, and in African American periodicals. As when the Courier described the Soul City Sioux broadcast, excoriating black soldiers as slaves to the American white man and claiming we are all of the colored race. Although the overall effort of such missives is difficult to gauge, the vehemence with which post war authors took pains to portray black soldiers as equal partners in resisting communism raises a distinct set of questions particularly when the absolute refusal to maintain statistics um, <clears throat> is recalled. Nor has sufficient research been conducted into that handful of African American soldiers known to have refused repatriation. Unlike several of the white soldiers who chose to remain in North Korea, none of the three African American detainees possessed a familiarity with either Marxism or, in fact, the location of Korea. Thus, the effort to survive America rather than any affinity with scientific socialism explained the decisions of the soldiers who defected. Corporal Loran Sullivan uh, had known childhood poverty so severe, he was from Santa Barbara, uh, had known childhood poverty so severe that the authors of a book on GI deserters concluded, you cannot find anyone in Santa Barbara who is willing to condemn him for turning his back on America. Captured in the chaotic days following the initial Chinese intervention, Sullivan's treatment at a uh, People's Liberation Army uh, hospital, I think this is the first time he'd ever been in a hospital, in fact, prompted him to oppose the war as he declared in a letter to his grandmother that is not being fought for the common people. Like Sullivan, Privates William White and Clarence Adams refused to return to the United States. Both were Southerners. Few familiar with White of Plummerville, Arkansas, population 550, could understand why he elected to stay in China. Although his description by a former employer as a good worker, not one of them rowdy niggers, suggests something of the world he chose to leave behind. A Memphis native, Adams had been assigned to an all-black artillery unit ordered to advance even as white soldiers retreated past them. Convinced his unit had been sacrificed in order to save white lives, Adams was further incensed by what he saw as pervasive racism among white prisoners. Openly critical of American society, Adams was seen as a progressive prisoner by Chinese and placed in charge of the prison library. Choosing to remain, he married a Chinese woman, attended a university degree, and started a family before returning to the United States during the turmoil of the Cultural Revolution. This is the end of the first section of the uh, paper, and the second one is shorter, and I'll just kind of skip through a few parts of it, um, which deals with the war at home. Midway through 1949, San Francisco-based Spire Records released a sparse 78 RPM single by California blues pianist and migrant agricultural worker Mercy B. Walton. In lyrics familiar to many a young man, GI Fever described unsuccessful efforts to compete for the attention of women disposed toward those in uniform. Walton sang, I can dress up in my finest, she don't even look my way. I can dress up in my finest, she don't even look my way. Just starts talking about that sergeant she saw downtown that day. Now I'm going down to the draft board, going to get on my knees. Going down to the draft board, get down on my knees. I ask them to give me some position, and that man's on your knees. Walton had written and performed GI Fever during the years of the Second World War, as defense employment ignited a nightclub group from Oakland to San Diego. Against the backdrop of a new mobilization, Spire Records founder Chester Liu doubtlessly imagined the record would capture audiences gearing up for another war. For the unfortunate uh, singer and sometime cotton picker, however, the single sold poorly among audiences, dealing less with GI fever than with reconversion blues. Mostly, the latest war found black people at home anxious and uneasy. B.B. King's mournful lament, Sweet 16, included the lyrics, My brother's in Korea, my sister's in New Orleans. You know I'm having so much trouble with people, so baby, I wonder what the world is going to happen. During 1951 and 1952, J.B. Lenoir recorded several songs critical of the war and its effects, including Eisenhower Blues, I'm in Korea, and Korean Blues. In the latter, the guitarist asked, who you gonna let lay down in my bed when the Chinese shoot me down in Korea somewhere? Confusion of the war was aptly summarized in an editorial cartoon published in the Pittsburgh Courier. In it, a woman looking in on a neighbor listens as her friend complains. That no good Bootsy keeps the television and radio all day long, and all you can hear around here is Jackie's at the back, counts one and two, the North Koreans done run MacArthur back another ten miles, there's a sharp hit to shortstop, and MacArthur say don't pay him no mind. 
Sister, I'm so messed up, I find myself trying to sweep the hallway with a fire extinguisher. <laughs> African Americans were not alone in either experiencing difficulty coming to grips with the meaning of this war, coming to grips with the meaning of this war, or expressing dissent. Uh, and so the full story of opposition to the Korean War must be told elsewhere. What is important to recall here is that both the broad lack of support among a majority of African Americans and the specific expressions of dissent among a much smaller white global <coughs> minority, state repression against the left and the decline uh, state repression against the left meant that the most visible black opposition to the war came from left-leaning black radicals formerly uh, independent of any group affiliation. This included initially Robeson, Du Bois, and Bass, as well as artists like Aaron Douglas and Charles White, clergyman Edward McGowan and uh, J. Raymond Henderson, and journalist Beth Masters. During the first year, the Council on African Affairs constituted the primary political home of this tendency, at least for the dissemination of information. In her guise as Progressive Party Vice Presidential Candidate, Charlotte Bass toured the United States announcing the war. Du Bois addressed rallies in the North Coast, gathering signatures for the Stockholm Peace Appeal against the use of atomic weapons, uh, as, just as students began practicing duck and cover drills nationwide. Ropes enjoyed the sit-in of school children in New York uh, who staged a protest at the UN to protest ambiguous American comments that seemed to suggest a possible nuclear attack against China. Neither the poor electoral fortunes of the Progressive Party nor the subsequent marginalization of Ropes and Du Bois should be taken as evidence that proponents of peace lack any kind of mass base. More than one million Americans signed the Stockholm Appeal, with up to 35,000 signing in Los Angeles during one fourth of the July weekend alone. Accounts published in the Daily World reported strong support for the petition among African Americans, a factor that perhaps explains why the petition drive became the basis of the federal government's legal complaint against the octogenarian Du Bois. Polls taken in March of 1952 revealed that only 13% of black women supported the U.S. effort in Korea, making black women the group of Americans most opposed to continuing the war. According to journalist John Pittman, opposition was the dominant black view of the war, extending from Negroes in uniform through farmers, industrial workers, white collar workers, domestics, housewives, small businessmen, and many professionals. Although he was biased, he was a communist journalist. Pittman wasn't wrong. Two years into the war, the majority of African Americans, 55%, supported negotiation or an immediate withdrawal, options that a slight minority, 44% of whites, found more appealing than continuing to seek a decisive victory. Although most opposition to the war in Korea was verbal in nature, draft resistance was more pronounced than in either World War. Nearly 1.5% of draftees sought conscientious objector status, a rate 10 times that of World War II and the federal government investigated thousands of draft, cases of draft evasion. Estimates of evasion ran as high as 30% in Harlem alone, and African Americans ultimately represented almost a quarter of those arrested for violating the Sel Selective Service Act of 1948. Among those inducted, military service often proved a radicalizing experience. In addition to those like James Lawson and Bob Moses, who sought to avoid the military, many black radicals active in the 1960s served in War. A decorated serviceman with a Purple Heart, a Korean Service Medal, a Republic of Korea Presidential Unit Citation, Ivory Perry served prison time after a questionable arrest in court martial. Ivory Perry is a man who George Lipsitz wrote a, a, a quite an interesting book about a sort of a popular civil rights figure, locally based figure, um, called Life in the Struggle. Korea later recalled his military experience by saying, I should have been in Korea in the first place. Dishonorably discharged from the Marine Corps, black power pioneer Robert Williams termed the conflict a stupid waste. Black Panther Party co-founder Bobby Seale listed racial incidents during the war as one reason for his subsequent radicalization, while James Foreman, eventual director of SNCC's International Affairs Bureau, served an unhappy stint in the Air Force during this time. The link between service in Korea and the black power movement suggests the extent to which the Korean War deserves to be seen not simply as the trigger for the more or less full desegregation of the American military, but as part of a larger internationalist counter-narrative to the domesticating impulses of the Cold War. Black interest in India and China, in African liberation, in Puerto Rican nationalism, in the West Indies and the Middle East, all surged during the 1950s. Responses vacillated between support for military integration and fury at the representations of black soldiers. 
between the desire for fully participation in American life and the growing appeal of a proto-clear worldism. <clears throat> Highlighting the insolubility of African and American, the war illustrated what one recent account calls the great divide in the modern black freedom movement between those who saw an identification with the U.S. state as the answer to black mass discontent and for those, uh, those for whom the national frame, and therefore the American state, was part of a problem that could only be solved across continents and seas. This is the very, very end. In a recent article, former Army Specialist Jorge Mariscal noted the cold ironies at play on a day when National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, I guess I should change this to say Secretary of State, <laughs> defended the Bush administration before the 9-11 Commission, while eight time zones away, Lieutenant General Ricardo Sanchez explained Iraq's deteriorating security situation at a military press briefing. Both Rice, an African-American of working class origins from the Deep South, and Sanchez, a Tejano of similarly humble economic origins, found themselves publicly defending decisions made by what Mariscal called a group of privileged white men whose commitment to telling the truth has proven to be negligible. Rice and Sanchez, like Secretary of State Colonel Powell or General John Abizaid, constitute some of the most visible faces of American power on the world stage. The political effect, intentional or otherwise, is clear. Echoing Stokely Carmine, who said, you can't eat Ralph Bunch for lunch, the Palestinian member of Knesset Azmi Bishada noted caustically, people are sick and tired of the sound bites of John Abu Zaid and Ricardo Sanchez. If one were to land in Iraq from another planet, you would suspect there are more non-whites in America than whites. This is identity politics of the cheapest sort. This military multiculturalism fulfills a clear role. Media representations of a colorblind army facilitate many of the binary moral imperatives at play in the contemporary war on terror. Promoting a multiracial army arrayed against an indistinguishable foe contrasts a modern and western universalism with a provincial and pre-modern region, deflects accusations of imperialism by proposing instead a struggle between competing ideologies, and suggests that the entire world, as represented by our Arab, Latino, and black statesmen and commanders, shares an interest in the outcomes that American policymakers desire. This story was familiar 50 years ago. The punitive United Nations command over a war financed and directed from Washington presaged the more recent fiction of a coalition of the willing. The Korean War provided the impetus for a specific reordering of American race relations, paving the way for the emergence of the belief that the United States military, the primary purveyors of organized violence on this planet today, somehow represents the most meritocratic institution in American society. Finally, and most broadly, the American-led world war against Islam, like the American-directed world war against communism, confronts an enemy whose long record of racial mixing necessitates a very public presentation of American universalism. Such universalism, of course, when observed at home, when unobserved at home. Racial progress consistently stalled in the interests of national security, from the collapse of interracial unionization efforts in the 1940s Jim Crow South amidst the red baiting, through the fiscal evisceration of the war on poverty as a result of Vietnam. The post-war Red Scare, moreover, explicitly targeted non-citizens, casting communism as a foreign-born illness treatable with summary arrests, jailing, and deportation. Neither racial reaction nor military multiculturalism exhausts the links between the Cold War and the War on Terror. Ongoing events in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Philippines have raised anew the idea that some small, weak, confused and dangerous segment of our own population may hold strange ideas planted from afar that are germinating slowly in our ostensible open society. Poor Latino from Chicago switches religions while in prison. An affluent white kid from Marin turns his back on America. A black American Muslim is photographed in a Philippine guerrilla hideout. Of all colors and normal enough to look at, inside, however, they seed with rage inculcated in foreign schools foreign mosques or foreign battlefields, brainwashing them would seem as bad. Or so the recent decisions of Hollywood would seem to suggest. Although World War II and Vietnam constitute the primary analogies utilized by the right and the left, respectively, in framing the war on terror, it is perhaps less than accidental that rather than remaking either the Big Red One or Apocalypse Now, Paramount Pictures spent $80 million making 
for more than $35 million advertising the remake of the 1962 classic of Cold War paranoia, the Manchurian Candidate. Paramount's 2004 effort perhaps reflects little more than the desperation of the film industry engaged in the sorts of recycling decried by Theodore Adorno. The replacement of Manchuria, however, with a deterritorialized corporate concern certainly suggests little in the way of continuity with the earlier historical moment. Still, the figure of Sergeant Marco, this is Denzel's character, as a confused former serviceman whose loyalty to the United States provides his sole path to clarity, suggests powerfully the idea that America can in the end be seen as the only possible affiliation for African Americans in or out of uniform. It is not, it's hard here not to hear the echo of a half century of the project of integration. And so, for those for whom integration has failed, perhaps there are lessons to be learned from a war and a world where an infantryman could enter enthused with patriotism or just in need of a job and ultimately elect to remain a permanent member of the People's Republic of China. Like other political projects, memory and history involve the active organization and mobilization of consciousness and resource. Thus, in considering a counter-narrative of opposition and unease during the Korean War, we might, at the very least, begin to make space for alternate histories, alternate imaginations, and therefore alternate politics imagined outside, and perhaps arrayed against the national frame. That's it for me. What's the next stage that you're, you're looking at uh, after feedback? Are you presenting at any upcoming conferences? Um, I presented an iteration of this at UCSD, and then uh, it's going to go to Duke um, for this anthology, which hopefully will be out by the end of the year or early next year. So I just have you know a couple more weeks to tweet parts of it. I know you mentioned uh, one of your former colleagues uh, from Berkeley and her research, uh, Charlotta Bass. Have yes. you collaborated any with Regina? A little bit, yeah. yeah. In fact, um, not so much on this, but because we're both doing some work on uh, the 40s, Black LA in the 40s, we've had a lot of um, communication about, about the earlier period. Bass is a, an extraordinary figure, a fascinating woman. And I think uh, Regina's book will be very important in time. Definitely. Definitely. A couple yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, my uncle and your great uncle was in uh, World War II and Korea. And um, what happened is he had just joined the National Guard for the National and got back right when the war started. But um, during the war, during the very beginning of the war, um, and I, I don't I think it was the 24th, but was there a 101st black unit? Anyway, whichever one, there were reports about this black unit that was advancing into enemy territory, and then they got sort of cut off and surrounded by by either North Korean or uh, probably North Korean forces. They got sort of, you know, in other words, they, they advanced beyond where their supply line was. And there, and there was a lot of uh, um, parts of that in the, in, the, uh, in the press. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, the, the, the unfortunate thing about studying um, Korea, or the Korean War of this time period, is that um, the Second World War is covered primarily by journal, by the print journals. And Vietnam primarily is televised. And I have this suspicion uh, that the Korean War was primarily explained through radio. And so there's there's less access to the kind of day-to-day -day primary source material about what people heard or and so these questions. So it's interesting because you know I really wanted to get it to be able to delve into how people, you know, what people thought about all this stuff. And by the 50s black newspapers are um, you have to be careful with them as a source because people are, you know, it's not the primary way people are getting their information. Um, but yeah, it's really amazing. I mean, you, I had initially a, an idea to do a paper trying to figure out how many uh, American soldiers have been killed in the course of American history um, because 
racist generals were absolutely convinced that people of color couldn't fight. Because this happens all the time. You know, they would send these like tiny, it's like Custer, right? You know, splitting his force and splitting his force, and sooner or later, um, you know. And it's not like the Chinese were hiding how they fought. I mean, Mao has a whole statement where he says, our philosophy is use 10 to attack one. I mean, so, it's yeah. not funny. It was like telegraph, too. But yeah, no, that's not. I mean, that's the thing, you know. People were put in situations where they just had, they couldn't win, you know, and then they were, they became scapegoats for, you know, the larger things that happened. This really picks up on something that you did devote much time, so maybe a fair question, but when you talk about Robeson at the UN, given the anti colonialism efforts at the UN and so on, did any of this play off in, in discussions, negotiations, mm -hmm. protests? directed at the UN as a way of trying to bring the body in a different way to, uh, to yeah. influence what happened? It's interesting. I mean, the whole reason why the United Nations, why the forces are ostensibly under UN command, um, as you, I'm sure you don't know, is because the Russians are protesting the United Nations' refusal to seat the Chinese. And so um, I think it's Molotov. Minister. It's like out of the security chamber room, like you know, he's getting a cup of coffee, having a cigarette, and they vote while he's gone, like, well, the UN will command, you know, sort of this movie that they vote. But um, you know, it's, the UN is tough in the in the in that early period because there is a commitment to desegregation, you know, on the part of the states, but it's very particular, and this is right on the cusp before you start to get the kind of emergence of the Afro-Asian movement, you know, Nehru um, and Sean Lyons. And so, you know, there's that rhetorical struggle being waged, but the numbers aren't there for them to actually achieve too much, I think, um, in there. But it's it's an important question, and it's something that, you know, should probably be, you know, a little bit to our spoken. It would add anything to what's already a great paper. Oh, I, I just was kind of curious. No, I think, I mean, I appreciate that. But also, I think the questions that occur to people are questions that occur to people who read these things, so it's helpful to me. There's also the movies that came out about the Korean War, uh, like Home of the Brave. Definitely have a, a definite impact on, on the picture of racism. Well, what happened with this paper was, originally, the whole paper was framed around the movie Steel Helmet, which is a great film. Just a great what, what was the name the, of it? Steel Helmet. Okay. It's by uh, Sam Fuller, the guy who made the big red. And it has a, it's, it's extraordinary because it's about this kind of lost patrol. You know, lost patrol is this trope for war movies. But um, there's a Japanese American guy, a black guy, a kind of racist white guy, and they acquire this sort of Korean child who follows them around. And they work out all of this racial stuff. And there's a scene where they capture this North Korean. Or maybe he's Chinese. And he first starts in on this Japanese guy, like, why are you working with these people? They probably had your family in a camp. And he's like, yeah, they did, but you're not going to get me. And then he's talking to this black guy, what's wrong with you, man? We're both colored. And so there's this real, like, uh, deliberate attempt to check all of these um, anti imperialist narratives. But the film's also really racially liberal. So the racist people are constantly being shown up or exposing themselves as limited. So you really see this kind of beginning of liberalism that's hostile to the left and has a kind of anti-racism. And it's a great film. And he made it like halfway through the war. So it's totally up in the air. It's kind of vaguely anti-war. It's a really interesting film. Um, but what happened to me was this paper was 12,000 words. And um, the editors called me and said, OK, it's great, but it needs to be 5,000 words. <laughs> so, um, a lot, a lot, a lot uh, dropped out. But that's just right better. I think there was a fairly large amount of Ethiopian soldiers that were sent to Korea. And I don't heard that you mentioned, mentioned them at all. I was wondering, do you, do you have any information if they met or what was the That's a really good question. That's a really good question. Um, they do show up um, 
in the sources, uh, they were, I think, a medical detachment. Who is this? Ethiopian. Oh, okay. Yeah. Soldiers. I mean, they had combat units, but they were yeah. primarily uh, support and medical units. Mm -hmm. um, although the way the war happened was so much back and forth, um, it's like the war in Iraq, I and mean, everybody ultimately pretty much was fighting. Um, that's an interesting question. You know, Ethiopia is really interesting in this moment because they they participate in the. Um, it's fascinating. They're like they're in this Afro Asian milieu, right? Um, and they're the only delegation that comes to the Bandung conference. Like uh, they try to sneak these white people in. So like uh, you know the Indonesians and um, all of these other people. Like what did you you know? It's like no white people can come to this thing. And they're like well these are. They're Soviet advisors. Um, so on the one hand, like Ethiopia is not a left government at all, but they have these kind of like Soviet guys, but they bring them to Bandung, which is nice. But it's just very, they're really complicated. Um, and it's actually, I, mean, I don't know about the historiography, but I think a study of Ethiopian diplomacy in that moment would be extraordinary because, you know, in the 20s, um, one of the kind of, uh, there's an Ethiopian, uh, I think a man, I think he's a man, part of the royal family, who's engaged to um, one of the daughters of the Japanese emperor, or nieces of the Japanese And there's this moment where Ethiopia and Japan are going to have this royal wedding, um, which is an amazing, and Du Bois gets really excited about this and, and injects a kind of not very good novel. <laughs> but no, I think it's an interesting, that's something I should um, go back and look at. Uh, going back to this, uh, one of the late, last points you made about this you know, theologic uh, struggle rather than a religious uh, struggle, I, I wonder uh, if you, you noticed just recently on the news, maybe last night, that two young women were arrested from Bangladesh because they were, that it was said that they were training to be suicide bombers. And I, I'm wondering, I, you know, I was listening to you talk about the Manchurian candidate, how this, this could just, you know, that the only way for a black person to, to, to go is to align with uh, a country like this one, even though it's, it's flawed. Uh, I wonder if you could speak about that a little bit, but the, the so-called ideologic as opposed to religious struggle going on today, how that relates to your stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there's an interest, not even an interest, there's a necessity in not having the war on terror be seen as um, a religious war on the part of the United States. Um, both because that will place their allies in um, the Middle East and South Asia in a totally untenable position. And it will create really revolutionary, it will facilitate revolutionary conditions in places like Egypt and Pakistan and um, Indonesia and those places. There's a way that it can't be that, but, um, but it obviously is, right? And um, American policymakers are not they're not able to make the kind of subtle discussions between distinctions rather between political Islam and whatever they want to have, militant Islam, however they want to term it, and a more mainstream, um, moderate, whatever other terminology is used, form of Islamism. Um, and because they can't have that sort of um, like nuance, they have to frame the war around these kind of idiotic questions about, you know, we're fighting a war on terrorism, which is asinine, because terrorism is a way of doing something. It's like having a war against carpentry. It's, it makes, you can't fight now. And, you know, I heard somebody say, and I thought it was quite sharp, he says, you know, the first two times we had wars on something, we had a war on poverty, we had a war on drugs, and we lost both those wars pretty inclusively, I think. So what's suggested by the terminology of on terrorism. It's not good. Um, but I think, you know, one of the most interesting things about the war on 
terror from the point of view of race and ethnicity in the states is the way that um, it's redefined South Asian and Middle Eastern people who had an ambivalent but a real white privilege in the society for a long time has turned them into people of color uh, very rapidly. So you get to see the extent to which the United States is a place for making race. Um, and I think also, you know, if this thing goes on for a generation, as it is more than likely to do, um, we're going to see a time period where most of the people who are detained or arrested or captured as quote unquote terrorists inside of the U.S. are black. I think that's an obvious way to think about how this is going to go. And, and that is going to suggest some very interesting things. How black people are going to deal with um, the first time we have an African American who blows himself up in a shopping center or uh, you know, crashes an airplane or something. It's going, be, it's going to be very interesting to see the backflips that Jesse and Lewis and Cornell and Skip and, and these folks have to do to explain that. Luckily, I'm only an assistant professor, and it's a ways away, so I don't have to do that. <laughs> well, well, didn't they have that the soldier that, uh, sure. that turned sure. over some people when he was over? Sure, and these people up in Oregon, I mean, I can remember, I went to a thing for, um, you know, after Rap Brown was arrested, mm -hmm. I went to like a benefit for him at this church out here, and his brother came from Atlanta, and this was, you know, significantly worse before September 11th, and I don't think you can say these kinds of things really anymore without getting a trip to the one part of Cuba that you don't want to go to. <laughs> um, but he made the point very explicitly, he said, and I don't agree with this particular said, um, you know, our perspective is that Islam and black liberation are, um, they're inseparable, that, you know, liberation of black people in the United States is completely tied to um, the rise of Islam on a world scale. And, you know, I can see why somebody would think that, because black radicalism has always been international has always been cross-national. And Islam is really the only utopian political force in the world today that, that functions transnationally. I mean, it's the only ideology where you, you can go to Indonesia and you find doctors from um, Eritrea. You know, you can go to the Philippines and you find Kuwaitis. You know, it, it, it functions the way that Marxism functioned in the era of decolonization. And so it's very easy to see how, especially an orthodox kind of Sunni Islam, would attract a certain kind of black nationalist um, in very different ways than and it appealed to them in the 60s when it was more a kind of rejection of Christianity and a cultural nationalism. That isn't where these people are at. Um, so I think we're in for interesting times politically. Um, I mean, assuming for a second that terrorism exists and is real and the whole thing just a kind of a, you know, a, what is it, a Reichstag fire to, you know, maintain the present political economy, which I don't get to go to those meetings either, so I don't know. But I think it's a really interesting, I mean, it's right on point for me. Well, thank you, Danny. Oh, she has one more. Oh, yeah. She's a prospective person. <laughs> Hopefully I haven't driven She's already away. going to Maryland. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, I was just wondering a little bit, you talked about the um, soldiers who chose not to be repatriated, mm -hmm. and I was wondering how the um, government of China, I guess, treated them or used them politically. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's a book called 21 State, and, it, and it's uh, kind of a, like a you know bantam book's account of these people, so it's not that helpful to, to explain in, in any depth, but it's a nice thing for source. Um, you know, people found their way to China a variety of ways. In fact, there's an article um, by Robin Kelly called Black Like Now um, that's good on the sort of whole sort of place China held within uh, the radical imaginary. But you know, like Robert Williams from North Carolina, he goes to China because he gets pissed off at the Cubans, you know, and um, 
so there's a, any number of black folks in China from you know maybe 50 until most everybody gets out in 67, 68 because the cultural revolution is so crazy and nobody understands what's going on. But, you know, the Chinese and, um, in particular, the Vietnamese did really extensive political work uh, among African Americans, um, especially the Vietnamese. You know, Ho Chi Minh lived in the United States. He worked in the same hotel that Malcolm X worked in earlier in Boston. And so, uh, and he wrote actually a book on, uh, a series of essays on lynching. So these are people who had, actually the most interesting thing about Ho Chi Minh is when he was a student in France, um, in the 20s, he wrote a novel about a communist revolution, an anti-colonial communist revolution that takes place in Senegal. Um, because he, you know, these guys were all in this milieu of Paris. Uh, and Brent Edwards, um, who's at Rutgers, has written a lot about this really brilliant stuff about this. Um, so, you know, it, it's interesting because the, this, everything that goes down in the 50s and the 60s um, is stuff that was happening in the 20s. You know, the seeds are all there from people being spread around. And I think it's interesting because we have so much mobility in the world right now <clears throat> that it raises an interesting question of in a place like London or Paris. Um, we have this real New York, we have this polyglot kind of communities. What forms of radical kind of contact do people are imagining? Um, and what we're likely to see a generation from now. Thanks, guys.